So we are going to have with us uh, Christina Catania, who is the senior partner of McKenzie & Company, along with Garance, uh, the CEO of AXA Emerging Customers, to present a masterclass on the opportunities of microfinance in developing in developed nation. Let's welcome our guest. Let's give them a round of applause. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. We're so excited with Christina to be here. Indeed. We've now coined ourselves the diabolical binoma. Um, I was looking at the, because right now I can't really see you, but uh, I was looking at the audience, I was looking at the audience, thank God for this person who's explained to me how to use a mic. Uh, I was looking at the audience with Christina from the side, and first of all, you look good, congratulations. Uh, but more importantly, they're really, really very few men. Uh, we need to engage them more, and those... Why don't you stand up, men, please? <laughs> How many men? Stand up. I think we need Ooh. to applaud you. <laughs> yes, 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 stay standing. Stay standing. Stand, 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 stand. Someone sat down. Stand. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. That's not a lot, huh? So we're told, so first of all, congratulations. There are two more there in the back. 12, 14. Uh, congratulations. I feel like you've had a lot of courage. Second of all, uh, I'm going to ask you in particular, but all of the women present for a call for action. I would like to ask you next year to each of you come with a man. No, but really. And the men who are here, you each get to come with a woman. But seriously, please, all of us next year, we are not allowed to register if we don't come with a man. We need to involve them in the discussion. Yeah? So that's our first call to action with Christina. But what we're here for today, and I'm going to hurry up because I can already tell that I'm <coughs> losing time, uh, is we wanted to talk to you about a report uh, that we wrote together, AXA and McKinsey, on microfinance, right? Uh, and maybe you feel like you've heard a lot about this, but mainly what we want to get to at the end, and, and hopefully we will need to keep time for a few questions, is, you know, why is it? Why is it that women, being a woman should be a risk? Right? We know that uh, vulnerability is not a situation. Please be convinced of that. It's not something you're stuck in. Vulnerability is a risk. What risk is it? Of not being able to make ends meet, right? That's what vulnerability is. Vulnerability when you want to do a business, launch a micro-entrepreneur business in the formal or informal economy, is of not being able to become a micro-entrepreneur for a variety of reasons. So, this is what we're going to talk to you about. But before I start, there is a polling question. So please, is there a QR code behind me? No. Can, can there be a QR code behind me? So this QR code that is going to magically appear. And you need to enter masterclass working, working group. group room. Ah, yes, Christina has much better memory than me. So when you, when you scan it on your phone, you'll have a series of options and you need to click on working class. No, masterclass, master working, class group. <laughs> working group. Mon Dieu, mon Dieu, l'âge. Bon. So, I'm going to let you Open it, please, all of you do it, please, please, please. Because we're gonna get a word cloud, right? And the question is, what do you think are the main issues hindering women-led micro-entrepreneurs, -entrepreneur, enterprises across the world? So not only in the emerging world, in the emerging and mature world. So while you're thinking about that, I think it's not very groundbreaking to say that women in the world, all over the world, in both types of markets, women entrepreneurs, they face bigger challenges than men. Uh, there's nothing to write home about, we've heard it, right? 
less income, lower access to capital, lower access to protection, lower access and to digital, more regulatory constraints, more household and caregiving responsibilities, so less time, etc., etc. right? So the risk landscape is probably more intense and different, at least. So we can take the metaphor, I was talking about this with my team, of there are two people running a marathon, a man, a woman, you know, she is going to have no shoes, he's going to have shoes, that's the education gap. He's going to have a light backpack, she's going to have a bag that she can only carry with her hands. Uh, that's the digital gap, right? He can have food whenever he wants and he can ask for more, that's the funding gap, etc., etc. He's going to be applauded throughout the marathon, she's not, at best. If not, she's booed, that's a cultural bias. That's the real situation. And you know what really is worrying me? And I'm going to get back to to microfinance in a second, but, what, but now that I've been given this platform. What I find very worrying is the little music that we're all hearing. The little music that we've spoken enough about women and gender equality. The, I don't know if it translates well the word, it's la petite musique in French, right? We're hearing the weak signals, right? We've heard enough about it, let's go to other forms of diversity because we've done it on the women's side. It's a very dangerous music. It's, I, I just want to repeat it, it's very dangerous. Is the glass, has the glass on gender equality, on gender equity gone from being half empty to half full? Yes. It's still half full. We cannot give, give up and we cannot let down our guards. Really, thank you. Especially because the inertia is actually continue to lower the level of the half full. Exactly. The inertia is not going to, uh, to make the glass more full. Exactly, exactly. Now it's not to say, you know I have a Lebanese friend, woman, uh, who said this to me the other day and, uh, and, and this is a tribute to her. Apparently there's a Lebanese expression because I'm not here to say either that things have not progressed. Things have progressed. Things have progressed thanks to you. And when I was saying this to her, she said, it's normal. Do you know why, Garance? I said, no, because she said, a tree that falls makes a lot of noise. A forest that grows is silent. So there is a lot of growing forests and growing trees in women's equality. Let's not forget it, but let's build on it. Back to microfinance. So we all know that in this world, about a fourth of business owners, new business owners are women, only a fourth. We can go to data. We can go to the origins. Did you know that about a billion people in the world don't have an ID card? They don't have formal ID. 650 million of those are women. That's 10 times the French population. Right? In the world, 7% more men have digital phones, access to digital. And then 20% less women can have digital but can't use it, etc., etc. My point being here, that we're going to focus from now on on the main point, uh, the main, let's say, as you see it here in your, in your word cloud, the main barrier or challenge for women micro-entrepreneurs is money, is funding, is support, is financing, is finance, as we see it here. But that financial inclusion cannot be alone, cannot be looked at alone. It needs to be looked at with digital. You know, money bank, uh, women bank tellers, women agents, women distribution agents need to be recruited if women micro-entrepreneurs want to take out loans. That's one. The second thing is linked to a holistic approach. Microfinance in the emerging world is unbelievable. You've heard about it, you've heard about Mohammed Yunus, you've heard about Bangladesh and Pakistan and then India, etc. But really, it's all over the emerging world now. And Christina will tell you why. It's less all over the mature world and it's going to be one of our calls for action. We're not going to ask you with Christina to find a solution for those one billion people to get an ID. We're not, uh, I mean, we're dreamers, but not uh, beyond realism. What we are going to ask you, those of you in the room who work for a bank, work for a financial institution, an insurer, work for a retail network, work for an SMC, FMCG, my call to action for you is, let's find a way for microfinance lending to exist more in mature countries. 
That's really one of my our call for actions. Back to my point. So microfinance in the emerging world, why, why is it so successful? Because it's innovative, right? For it's a majority of women that borrows through microfinance institution, a majority. And the way it's done is that it's proximity-based, it's trust-based, and it's a different use of credit scoring. And that's key, right? Because women don't tick the boxes of traditional credit scoring. Because usually they don't have a pay slip. Because the work they do at home is not uh, gratified yet by a salary. Right? So they don't tick the boxes. So they've done credit scoring in another way. It's group-based, it's social-based, etc., etc. And so microfinance, what is it doing? It's going beyond lending. Now it's doing saving. Because if you save better, actually you borrow better. And you allocate capital better. It's going further because it's understood, the microfinance sector, that it is well positioned to be a door, a door opener to all financial services. Why is this, in your opinion, particularly important for women entrepreneurs? I think you have it in your heads. For two reasons, and this was illustrated by a study we did a, a few years ago, AXA, with the IFC and Accenture. Two things, one, women, see life and business, as an extension, in a circular way, in a holistic way. Men see it in a much more linear way. Neither is better than the other. It's factual. What does it mean here? Is that women, for lots of reasons, their way of seeing life, the fact that they have less time, etc., etc., they need to go to the same place to get their credit, their savings, their payment, their pension, their payment for education, et cetera, et cetera, in the same place. The second thing that this report shows is that women have much weaker Chinese walls in their head and in their lives between their personal and their professional lives. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and look at your week. And on your phone, look at your to-do list. Do we agree that your week and your to-do list, for a lot of you, it's this is my meeting, this is what I have to read, this is and this, and this is how I, what I have to do for my mother and what I have to do for my daughter, and then I'm gonna go back to the office and then I'm gonna go to a supermarket and then my husband needs a dermatologist appointment. <laughs> we agree, you're all laughing because it's your case, right? All of you, except for our 15 heroes. Right, and actually I would be curious, on your to-do list and your week, is it mixed up like that? Is it really mixed up between your family, your friends and your work, your, your agenda, your to-do list? Yes or no? I would love to hear from you, maybe I'm wrong, but if you're here, you're already exceptional. Huh? But uh, a little bit, a little bit mixed up. Everyone, else, not enough. This guy deserves like a box of champagne. Um, who else wants to answer? I have to say I don't see you, huh? <laughs> and raise your hand where it's massively mixed up. This week's agenda, next week's agenda, last week's agenda, your to-do list. Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay, most of you. Okay, you see what I mean? Women don't have the same Chinese wall. And this, microfinance institutions are offering it. Because when they save, they save for their business, for their employees, and for their family. For their pension, for their retirement, and for the education. When they use their car, or their motorcycle, or whatever it is, it's for their business, and on the weekend to take their family somewhere. And their shop is in their home. This is very important. This goes to show you that a model like microfinance, which is based on three things, if anything, please leave this room with the three eyes. Information gathering, insight expression or insights and analysis, and innovation. The three eyes. They are not as easy as they sound. The microfinance model in the emerging world has proven it. So now I'm going to switch to Christina. But I'm going to finish with one thing. What was our first sentence that we pronounced between ourselves, Christina? We didn't meet each other in the beginning, but then we... So, as usual, it's the teams who really did the work. 
right? They're, they're much smarter than we are. We kind of are used as puppets. And uh, I don't know if it works very well, but in the makeup, I said to, she said, what do you want? I said, I want to look like Claudia Schiffer. And then it, nobody is saying hello, Claudia, to me, so I think it didn't work out. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but what was our first sentence? We said, our first sentence to conclude is financial, back to what I said, financial vulnerability, any kind of vulnerability is not a situation, it's a risk. But that, does that mean that being a woman is a risk? No, at AXA, really, we really are doing everything we can to say being a woman is not a risk, and neither should our future be a risk. And on this, Christina, you're going to talk to us about mature with a few questions. Yes. And Thank the you, mature Claudia. world, what we can do. You work. Oh, <laughs> you're welcome, <laughs> Naomi. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I just want to start um, uh, by saying that uh, I enjoyed very much to actually uh, do this, this working group together with uh, uh, AXA and Garance and uh, all the team. When the Women Forum asked us to, uh, um, to actually join this working group, I was actually moved because um, I thought I knew something about microfinance. I actually studied development economics uh, uh, at my university, and uh, I actually know inside out the, the world of uh, uh, Grameen Bank, because uh, it was one of my exams. And, uh, and I studied also, you know, mathematically, how it was possible to actually achieve such an impact with such a, at the, at the beginning, such a small community but the number of interlinks that actually this model created uh, was actually uh, so successful because uh, they managed actually to, uh, as you said, no, uh, to actually create the social pressure in these women, in fact, uh, that they actually wanted to monitor themselves the success of the others because if there was a delinquency case, then they wouldn't be able to have access to credit the, the next time they, was as, they were asking for. Um, so actually I was saying, um, I was convinced to know about microfinance, not necessarily for my profession, but for my background. And then we started working with, uh, with our research team and we were looking at you know, all the different possible sources uh, and the way, you know, McKinsey does things is really like not to, you know, uh, dig into numbers and understand. And actually, there's not a single source of truth for, you know, sizing the pot, which tells you already something. It tells you that uh, it's still extremely informal, successful, yes, but not systemic in the way that actually embeds, you know, the... Uh, public institutions, governments, sovereign national institutions that actually uh, can create the framework to really make it systemic. So this would be actually one of the calls for actions that uh, I, would I would love to make together with you all today. So having said that, we made our work and the number is uh, in the today's world, uh, the amount of new microloans globally ranges approximately uh, in the space of the 200 billion US dollars uh, globally. This pot is allocated 44% in Asia Pacific and 39% in uh, LATAM, okay? And uh, the, the reason why it's uh, so actually concentrated in these regions is definitely for historical regions. Every, everything started in Bangladesh, in fact, in the 80s. Um, and actually, in these regions, the target of microfinance is for 70% women. So it's basically tailored for women. It's a way of actually empowering women uh, to become sustainable entrepreneurs. Micro-entrepreneurs, of course, but in a sustainable way. So, uh, then we reflected when we saw these first evidences and we said, how is it possible that uh, this model only works in emerging markets? And is really the case that 
you know, in, in Western economies and in, development, in developed systems, we really don't need that. Especially in light of, you know, a widening gap in between rich and poor and uh, there's so many inequalities and, and, and silent uh, dynamics that are going on in, in, you know, in, in the women uh, world. And therefore, we started understanding a little bit why it's not the case that microfinance is, uh, is uh, widespread in the way we would like to see it. I think the first root cause is that, um, you know, financial worlds in Western economies, of course, more sophisticated and more accessible to, to many people. And therefore, definitely, there is, uh, you know, an easier access to, you know, to, to formal ways of, of funding. Uh, the other uh, possible cause is that uh, the, um, the model in, in developed economies is, um, is more driven by an NGO uh, type of setup. Mm. That means that actually a lot of these microfinance entities that are actually active in the, in the Western world, uh, they actually fail to get a banking license and they don't partner with financial institutions to actually, you know, make this synergy work. Okay. Uh, then I have a little question for you. That is, how much do you think that the pot for microfinance is worth in, uh, uh, in the Western world? If you can show the, the QR code. And then you need to enter the masterclass working group. This is still the other one, I think. It's Christmas. <laughs> no, this is, this is the last. There's one before. No. Yes, thank you. So how relevant do you think is the microloan um, is the micro loan market in developed countries? Less than 5%, 5 to 10, 10 to 20 in terms of uh, new loans, yes, every year. Now that I gave you the story, <laughs> you are very pessimistic, even, even too much. But, you know, the final answer is 5 to 10%. Uh, it's, um, and actually, uh, in Europe, potentially, is 5 to 10 percent. I mean, if we open the box of the United States, probably you're right, it's spot on. We don't have even the figures. I don't trust the figures, uh, so I don't give it. Uh, so 5, five to 10 percent is the right answer. And on top of that, it is not targeted as women. Because you remember the data that I gave you before, 70 percent for, uh, for Asia Pacific translates into 50% for these, uh, uh, these amount of loans in Europe, for example, which as, as an explanation, right? It means that there are a lot of categories that are actually benefiting from uh, microfinance in, in uh, a, a, an area like Europe. So not targeted to, or not completely targeted to uh, what we want to achieve. Okay, having said that, and, and given that I think that we don't have so much time left anymore, I think that um, I would like to uh, come towards a closing, and then of course, uh, if there are questions, uh, we are very keen to answer them. Uh, we want to make sure that this uh, changes for Western world. And our reflections and our recommendations is really around making sure that there is a regulatory framework that allows financial institutions to actually enter with a proper set of incentives this world in a even not with a non-for-profit proposition because this is not what happened in developing countries these institutions are for-profit organizations they are not anymore and not only non-for-profit so we would like to actually uh, push for having a regulatory framework potentially in Europe can also be harmonized across countries that allows financial institutions uh, to partner with NGOs uh, 
to actually make sure to have a systemic impact on this. And then, of course, the other call for action, and, and uh, uh, my friend Claudia here <laughs> uh, is actually a, uh, representing one of you know, the preeminent institutions in the microfinance world. I think that financial institutions, both banks and insurance, etc., they actually need to tailor the product offering to what we want to achieve here. And it's not only you know, granting the next loan to, uh, um, to somebody that entered the branch, but actually make sure to understand the needs of you know, the specific clusters of, uh, of uh, targeted segments and actually make sure to really listen in the end, which is one of the things that you told me the other day. Um, women need to be listened by uh, women-led minds as well. Right? And I think this needs to happen at scale. Um, so actually, I would pause here, and maybe I, I, I ask us to make uh, final comments and, and closing. Questions. Yes, otherwise we go for questions. I am sure a couple of you have questions. Ah, you see, I can't see anything, but there's a question over here, okay? Can someone bring you a mic? Or I go. Thank you very much for this uh, amazing masterclass and bringing up some data that I ignored about the uh, European countries and, and the rights that you just showed. <clears throat> I was wondering about the uh, disabled women who are the most vulnerable. And uh, throughout my, my position as a journalist, I have noticed in European countries mostly, they do separate between women and disabled women, which is awkward because we are... <laughs> We are women before being disabled women. Do you uh, ladies have any data regarding disabled women uh, versus microfinance? Thank you. Thank you. That's a very important question, actually. And it, uh, but we don't have time anymore. But next year, maybe. Uh, but what I am going to answer is one point. We have data on disabled populations. We have data that's gender segregated but not on disabled women, which is a very key point. It leads me to another just two sentences, uh, because I see they're rushing around in the front row, so we really have to hurry. But if you look in this time and place at the <coughs> fact that everything now is becoming about big and bigger and bigger and bigger data and algorithms and artificial intelligence and bigger computers and supercomputers, etc., right? And you look at the history. I'm not talking about the history of uh, before Christ. Huh? I'm talking about the history even 30, 40 years ago. There is no data on women before 30 years ago, basically. There isn't. It's just a silence. So what we're doing by basing our behaviors and our future thinking on data and on algorithms and on super AI and on supercomputers is that we are perpetuating the problem. We're perpetuating the half-truths. Because if there's a silence on half the population in history on data that we've collected, then basing the future on the past, like ChatGPT does, by basing it on the internet, we're perpetuating a problem. And that's up to us to stop it. One of it is on disaggregated, dis disabled women data who need access to finance. That's one, and it's key. But that's one of so many. And that's another call for action. Can we please make sure that one of the barriers to our equity with men, that is data silences, isn't perpetuated by those people who are men. And I'm not saying it's done voluntarily. I think it's viewed as being gender neutral. But when you look at the numbers, it's the men doing the coding a lot, huh? the men developing the AI a lot. And so they're not seeing this silence. I don't want us to be creuser notre propre tombe, how do you say? digging our own grave in a way because we are perpetuating a problem that we haven't been able to solve in the past. So please, that's another call for action. Let's really be careful about data. 
because we're going to wake up one morning and it will have taken over and we won't be part of the conversation. Thank you for your question on data. Thank you very much.